yeah, so technology, you're not entitled to criticise anything that the government is doing. Um, there's this bizarre role reversal right at the start in March um, when these debates were happening, where I had trolls on Twitter with Brexit party avatars telling me that I should trust the experts. Which, I mean, I thought that they weren't that keen on experts, but it turns out that <laughs> they were just the wrong sort of experts, I guess. Um, but I think, again, that the way that the crisis has played out has actually really profoundly exposed the dangers of that because it's become clear that experts actually really disagreed with each other on the best way forward the government hasn't always been following the science it's been making deeply political decisions based on its own priorities and democratic scrutiny is clearly has been more vital than ever because the decisions that have been being made are life or death decisions for literally thousands upon thousands of people so i think actually it's been a vindication of the necessity of democratic accountability, even in and you know perhaps especially in the midst of times of crisis, um, when a small group of people is taking life or death decisions under immense pressure. You know, maybe struggling to see the wood for the trees. Um, you know, I can well imagine that they might have been sort of blinded by the sophistication of their own mathematical models and believed that their you know that their models were correct where anybody outside of that bubble who was looking at what was happening in Italy could see that the assumptions of those models were incorrect and that we were headed for a disaster um, and I think this is relevant to democracy because you know Hillary I don't know if she may speak about this but Hillary's written about you know the importance of the tacit knowledge of people that are on the front line um, and how they can sometimes see things that people sat in an office in Whitehall can't see um, and I think that's been abundantly clear in this crisis, whether it's lack of PPE in hospitals or whether it's people warning there was a brewing disaster in care homes. I think we need to use that kind of dawning realisation to make the case that we take better decisions as a society when we draw on that tacit knowledge and that collective wisdom um, of everybody in society rather than leaving decisions to a small oligarchic elite. Um, and I would argue that we need to fight for that principle to be extended into other areas of life, um, including economics, where these arguments about expertise and technocracy have for a long time been used to close down um, the possibilities of democratic debate. Um, so I've heard some people <laughs> suggesting that, you know, through this crisis, we've become used to trusting scientists on public health. And now we need to seize the opportunity to do the same on climate change, for example. And personally, I really don't think that's the takeaway from this situation. Um, I think what we've learned is absolutely we do need to listen to experts and we need to use the best available evidence to inform our decisions. But ultimately, We've also learned that even highly technical decisions are always political. They always create winners and losers. They always involve trade-offs about what we value. And actually, they must be made through democratic deliberation. We can't hide behind the fact that something is technical or requires expertise as an excuse to deny people a voice in decisions that affect them. Um, and I think that's as true of climate change as it is of the pandemic, actually. Um, so I said I would talk about the economics as well as the politics, so just briefly want to do that. I think, um, I think this matters because large parts of the left became a bit disorientated, I think, in the early stages of the crisis, uh, where you had the Tories promising hundreds of billions of pounds of borrowing, underwriting wages on a massive scale, and people started kind of slightly overexcitedly heralding the Sunak road to socialism. Um, and I think that was kind of based on this sort of uh, default strain um, of analysis on the left that still exists that basically equates being progressive with a big interventionist state. And I'm not an anti-statist by any means. I actually do think that we need much more state intervention in the economy to move to a more just economic settlement. But that doesn't mean that state intervention in and of itself is progressive. Um, I think we absolutely need state intervention to weather a crisis like this. Um, but the critical question that we need to ask is what kind of state intervention, who benefits from it and who pays? And crucially, how does it affect the balance of power in the economy and the concentration of power? Right? Because we know that concentration of political power and concentration of economic power go hand in hand. And, you know, in 2008, we saw the same thing where the state intervened on an, in an unprecedented way, but in a way that reflected and reinforced existing imbalances of power, right? So it bailed out the banks um, and citizens ultimately paid the price for that with a decade of austerity. So it wasn't a democratic intervention in that sense. Um, and the research that's been mentioned that I worked on recently for IPPR 
we argued that basically a similar thing is happening again in that the government is once again underwriting the incomes and the losses of finance capital and rentier capital essentially um, so whether it's through guaranteeing loans to small businesses protects banks from losses and from the risk of default um, or whether it's through the furlough scheme which is effectively making sure that ordinary people can carry on paying their rent and paying their bills um, which is how you end up in a situation where a lot of people especially private renters are facing homelessness or being driven into debt um, and meanwhile their landlord's income is being almost completely protected and I think alongside that going back to, to what I was talking about earlier about tacit knowledge um, I think a lot of people's struggles during this pandemic economically have just been literally invisible to the Westminster elite that have been making policy and I think there's no clearer demonstration of that I don't know if people saw this astonishing admission from Boris Johnson in front of the liaison committee this week that he literally didn't know that migrants had no recourse to public funds um, and that there are huge numbers of migrants in this country that are struggling with homelessness and destitution for that reason during this crisis you know it's this combination of an extremely sheltered existence and a total lack of intellectual curiosity <laughs> means that these issues are simply invisible to them. Um, so yeah, I think uh, again, in some of these economic decisions, it really makes the case for um, the need for more democracy and deliberation. I think there's also a kind of interesting point here about centralization. Um, so the idea that you need a, a very centralized authoritarian bureaucracy to respond quickly in a crisis. Um, and I think in the economy as well, that's actually been proven to be false. Um, so it's interesting to note that big, big banks, big commercial banks have actually been really atrocious at getting loans to small businesses quickly, precisely because they don't have the tacit knowledge and the local relationships to assess credit worthiness. Um, they just abandoned that line of business a long time ago. Um, so why am I talking about all this in an event about democracy? <laughs> um, some of this economic stuff might might seem to be a bit of a tangent, but to me it's really central because ultimately democracy is about power, right? And economic and political power are deeply intertwined. And I firmly believe that you can't have democratic politics without a democratic economy and vice versa. So I think coming out of the crisis, we need to be asking how we can renew our democracy, both economically and politically. And in both cases, I think the principles are the same. Um, so we need institutions that genuinely give people an equal vote and an equal voice. Um, so this isn't just about voting every five years, but it's about how we make decisions in between elections. Um, we need to disperse power more evenly across the country away from where it's being hoarded in London, um, both economically and politically. We need to democratize ownership of wealth um, and power needs to flow upwards from communities and not downwards from an unaccountable elite um, and I think Hillary will talk more about some inspiring examples of how we can do that um, so that's really all that I wanted to say I think you know as in so many other areas we really need to use this crisis to think more imaginatively about what we're learning through this pandemic and how we can think more imaginatively about the kind of politics that we want and how to build back better um, how hopeful am I that we'll do that? You know, I actually think the events of this week have made me strangely more hopeful because I think this kind of right-wing brexit -y version of democracy that pits the people against the elite in a kind of authoritarian nationalist way has kind of run out of road now and has been exposed as the sham that it is. And a lot of people who previously bought into that are very, very angry right now. Um, and the best possible outcome of that would be to, if we can use that to open space for a kind of more imaginative, more human, more, particip more participatory vision of what democracy could be as we kind of build back better in the future. Thanks. I can't tell if that's Christine's connection or whether mine went a bit dead there. Um, did everyone hear that the last two sentences there? Can someone just let me know in the chat? Yeah, okay. It was just me then, no problem. Fabulous, thanks so much, Christine. Um, and yeah, really interesting to end on this idea that this really terrifying minimal version of what democracy means has kind of lost ground and 
um, yeah, that certainly gives me hope. So in a moment, we'll move on to hear from Hilary. So Hilary Wainwright is a, a leading writer on the emergence of new forms of democratic accountability and participation. She's the driving force behind the Red Pepper magazine and has documented loads of examples of resurgent democratic movements from Brazil to Britain and the lessons they provide for progressive politics. Her latest book is A New Politics from the Left and it's one I really enjoyed reading when it came out. She's a fellow of the Transnational Institute and has held numerous academic posts in the UK and further afield. And she was also involved in the popular planning unit of the Greater London Council during the Thatcher years. So we're going to hear from Hilary now to talk about some of the alternatives that she's been studying for a long time and what they may teach us about how we can improve our democracy in the coming years. So I will unmute you now, Hilary, and we'll pass over to you. There we are. Great. Well, firstly, it's, it's great to be here. I wish I could see people. I saw a kind of rough list and saw some familiar faces. Uh, and I'm sorry not to have participated in, um, in the earlier sessions. Um, I know that I would have liked to, particularly um, Adam Ramsey's. Um, anyway, I want to bounce off um, Christine's really great, really brilliant um, sort of survey of the present situation and agree that that we see, we've seen this week the limits of um, this minimal democracy. But also, as she was hinting, we've seen um, the limits of sort of right-wing populism. I mean, um, I've always felt, you know, that populism, like many other people, um, has got sort of two sides to it. There's the right-wing form in which people invest so much in, in a leader, you know, they project everything into a leader. I mean, God forbid why they projected it into Boris Johnson, but they kind of did, or into Brexit, into a particular slogan. Um, and I mean, that's happened on the left, but for that, for me, that's not what a sort of truly democratic populism is about, that sort of belief in a leader, whether it's, whether it's a left leader like Chavez or, or Fidel Castro, or right-wing leader. I think that that a true democratic populism is about, in effect, it's about, about self-government, about popular democracy, about popular control over state resources and over the economic, over, over production, and, and including the production of services. And I think I, I just, well, you just feel the whole Cummings thing, given that he was the architect of this populism in, in the UK. Um, in a way that's going to lead people who are completely rightly disaffected with the existing political system. And in a way one's got to recognize that that, that sort of right-wing populism did, and, and, and the conservative strength did come from um, a sort of disaffection with the political system. Sorry, my battery's running low, I've just got to plug it in again, probably. Um, but um, whether that, that, that should now turn to forms of of self-government and self-organisation, uh, which one's seen many forms of during this crisis. And so I wanted to talk really about what experiences we can build on, both in our present situation and then um, internationally and historically. Um, so uh, excuse it if it's a bit sort of, you know, going all over the place, because there is a lot to say that is rather scattered. It's not in a way been brought together by by real social forces and no one person can sort of do that so i think we the situation we're in is one with real resources it's got real dangers as christine has, has identified and so did adam um, but there is also a real um real signs of 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 hope i mean um when christine was talking about the lockdown and it being so late in a sense another feature of our lockdown was actually people were locking down before the government. There was a kind of um, a, a recognition of the, the social crisis, the threat to health, um, and people were were locking down, you know, themselves. Uh, and I think that that theme, or it's more than a theme, it's a reality. That conflict between um, the needs of the economy, the needs of of profit, of finance and the needs of, of, well, life really, the right, to, the right to, to breathe, as somebody said in a brilliant seminar organized by Unlock Democracy yesterday. 
Um, and, and I think that that's meant that, you know, kind of completely, um, I don't know, uniquely, it's almost without historical precedence, we have this conflict in daily life visibly before us in every, you know, every day in the news of the conflict between a system or a set of decisions and, and actions based on need and, and, and the protection of human life and the needs of, 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 of children, of elderly people, of everybody, the needs of, of, of care workers, um, you know, in direct conflict with, with um, the need for profit. I mean, not the need for profit, but the, the profit dynamic. Sorry, I was just to turn off my um, phone. Um, sorry, and so um, I think that's a possibility, a real kind of potentiality because it's, it's also got, um, it's got, it's not just an idea, it's not just in the kind of cultural, ideological, so it's in daily reality. So that, um, you know, we just see around us in our neighbourhoods the, the strength of mutuality and the fact that, that one aspect of this, um, this self-government, which in a way it's happening not only in the, the, the way in which people brought um, the lockdown themselves, that, but also now you're seeing people are against lifting it quickly. People are continuing to take action, protective action. I mean, somebody was telling me on the overground uh, and the underground, there's 80% of people are wearing masks, even though there's not been a sort of, you know, Boris Johnson's never said wear masks on public transport, but public servants have, have taken that upon themselves to, to, in, to insist on it or recommend it. And then pe the people have done it themselves. Uh, and so, you know, in, in, in daily life, you see all these forms of mutuality, certainly in my area, you not only have it on WhatsApp, uh, many different, I mean, a, a mutual aid group started in my area, which then sort of split it according to different needs. So one group started to um, look at the needs of people in homeless, in, in the hospital, hospitals for the homeless. Um, others were looking at um, the needs of, of care workers. And, and so you, you're kind of getting a plethora of people beginning to organise according to a social need and mutuality. And I think that points to the fact that actually, although we often you know, sort of are demoralised by the fact that, that neoliberalism, consumerism, individually, individualism has sort of gone deep. I, I actually question whether that's the case and would argue that even if one looked, I remember looking at surveys done under Thatcher and people still believed in public services uh, and in unions too. And I think that belief in public services and belief in, in mutuality you know, has lasted uh, and it's still expressed in what's left of um, the public sector and in local government. I mean, um, you know, I've, I've been always sceptical of many local councils and the tendency to corrupt, well, sort of in a kind of pragmatic corruption, sort of day-to-day -day corruption, um, the ways in which often it's been the right of the Labour Party that's dominated local government. But actually, I've been really impressed by um, certainly in my area, the way that local government has, has responded to the, the, the sort of swelling of, of mutuality at a grassroots level. They've responded and supported that. Um, and I think that's quite common. And I think, um, as in, in the way that Christine hinted at too, I think the whole com neglect and contempt, you know, the contempt of local government that one's seen running through um, the government's response you know, I mean, the, the, the creation of this app um, to deal with testing and, and tracing uh, in a situation where actually you've got the whole infrastructure of, of public health officers who are trained for that purpose. And so I think that one of the issues that, that we're going to be um, addressing after the, you know, after the lockdown or maybe as it lifts is a sort of revival of local government and how we can sort of combine the new kinds of um, mutuality, active mutuality that are emerging with the development of a more democratic kind of local government and how there we can learn from the, some of the international experiences that, that, Matt, uh, that Sam was talking about. Um, you know, for example, the, perhaps the best known that I studied is the participatory 
um, democracy participatory budgeting in in Brazil. And I think you know that had built on um, every, every every experiment builds on previous experiences, and that had built on um, the experiences of fighting the dictatorship uh, at a local level and building up a sort of civic democratic resistance. And I think now in this from this experience, I mean, after all, it's been it's been nearly three months, and it will be um, by the time the lockdown is free, and that's is is lifted. And that's long enough to form habits and relationships and new new networks. And I think we have we've seen a new way of organising that is horizontal. That but that in turn builds on um, experiments and experiences of that horizontal mutuality that goes back, um, you know, in my experience back even to '68, the women's movement, the student movement, uh, and again, there's been a very good discussion in open democracy. Um, I mean, here am I promoting open democracy, and I should be also promoting Red Pepper, which I, I, I would do anyway. But um, in open democracy, there's been a very good debate started by a piece by Anthony Barnett, a brilliant piece um, called Out of the, the Belly of Hell. And he's talking about both the challenges and threats, but also the potentiality that he argues goes back to 68. And just building on that, I'd say, that almost like a mountain stream, there'd been, there's been this sort of alternative vision of society, the democratic self-governing society, a desire for self-government, as Raymond Williams put it, um, that, like is, that keeps bubbling up. It goes underground or it's repressed and defeated, but it keeps bubbling up. And, and that's what we've seen uh, in the ultra-globalization movement uh, we've seen it in the in the amazing uh, climate change movement led by young people, uh, and we're seeing it again now. And it's an incredible um, sort of resource. And I think also we've seen how that it 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 pervades many institutions. It's it's pervading local government, and one's seeing local government, you know, having to respond to to the organised people um, in a way that it hasn't for some time. But we're also seeing it in the unions. You know the really impressive stand of the of the teachers union who who are a really significant union because a they're very democratic very participatory they've had um people fighting for democracy in the union for the last 30 to 40 years who are now in the leadership of that union. again a long tradition in in the teachers unions of being concerned with the content of education not just with wages and conditions but with its purpose and it's 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 very you know very very nature the, the issue of children and therefore parents and community as well and so their stand which is really kind of rethink the opening of schools again they force need and and safety and security um to the fore in conflict with the 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 pressures of the economy the pressures to get um, people back to work um, and so I think again we can see in the unions hopefully shifts in this more social direction which I think also building on Christine's emphasis on combining um, economic democracy with um, with with political democracy I think another thing one's seen with a union dimension is this whole conversion of production I mean I did a little sort of mini study, because I was a bit bored with lockdown, of, um, of the conversion of um, aircraft manufacture to ventilators. And although there are many problems with, with some of the production of ventilators, in the case of Airbus, they produced um, a ventilator with an existing ventilator company, which didn't have the, the sufficient capacity. And they, they turned an Airbus factory into, in, um, in, in North Wales, a part of it, into um, the production of ventilators, having been working on aircraft wings. And this involved um, mainly you know, the union. I mean, management agreed with it, but the union and its tacit, tacit knowledge and organization provided the, the wherewithal to make that, that quick shift. And I hope that now that one's going to see the decline of the aircraft industry, a key aspect of preparing for climate change and we now know what preparing for a, a crisis a human crisis a, 
a crisis of humanity involves will mean that this whole conversion of our of our manufacturing capacity towards a low carbon economy will be at the ascent the center um, of the union movement so i probably need to begin to stop there is that right sam have i got maybe one minute so i want to end up by really trying to summarize this by saying what we are needing is is a different kind of state a state which is nurturing and supporting self-government and the transformative capacity of ordinary people and just finally on the knowledge thing i mean christine kindly mentioned this argument about tacit knowledge that i developed in my latest book and, and the importance of a politics that a, a politics can only be truly democratic if it treats people not as voters simply or party members due you know people who pay the dues but actually as knowledgeable um Of, of 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 the kind of wealth and and provision that can meet social need but you know in terms of the existing economy i don't think there's a going back to normal we've got to change ourselves to it but it's been driven home to me by leach but also the importance of democratizing scientific knowledge i think one of the most interesting developments there is the development of this alternative sage a group of scientists who've come together to say this this present system the sage system is so secretive so undemocratic untransparent that it it it's treating the people as you know as as as, as kind of just you know dumb uh, and so we've got to recognize that people can understand um, uh, the, the, the significance of scientific debate and need to be part of that. And so democratizing science must be part of democratizing the economy and democratizing the state. So in the interest of democracy, I'll end. <laughs> Fabulous, Hilary, thanks so much. That that pulls together so many interlinking um, points. My mind's kind of swimming with potentialities there. Um, we've had some really great questions in. Keep keep pushing them in if something's recently occurred to you. But I wanted to put something to you both that's kind of a, a mix, hopefully, of quite a lot of comments people have made, which is that we've seen this amazing explosion of uh, mutual aid groups and just kind of organic growth in in community spirit that was maybe submerged under the depth of neoliberalism and people kind of assumed that everyone else was quite selfish but they weren't and that's kind of now been shown to be uh, untrue but what someone has also said i think is is there a risk that with things slowly starting to go back to normal people go back to their their jobs the routines resemble more what happened before that some of these things could be forgotten or do you think that these changes are now big enough that the cat's out of the bag in a way? Because um, you've also mentioned how uh, there's open conflicts between the interests of the state and those that occupy it and ordinary people in a way that has been that is rarely been as clear as this. So, yeah. Um, is it something that's going to happen organically? Is that going to carry on or do we need to fight really hard to retain that new spirit of mutuality? Um, do you want me to say something? Uh, Christine too? D sorry, Sam, do you want me to say something? So uh, it's a good question. And I'd say it actually, it depends on, on us. I think that here's another case where us on the left need to um, change. I mean, I think if we're to really build on and nurture that spirit and reality of mutuality we've got to get out of our normal kind of bubbles and and internal debates as it were and and actually connect with the people that um are, are, are being most active in these groups which isn't always people on the left or people who are politically organized so we've got to we've got to reach out not just in the sense of forming formal alliances but you know recognize that on our street in our neighborhood you know when i go for my walk my hourly walk uh, my my daily walk you know i see notices pinned on playgrounds saying you know if in this area you know you're wanting help or 
you're wanting support, please contact so and so, just like unwritten notice. And so we need to make connection with those sort of people and discuss with them how they um, they want to continue, what needs you know, often people will have identified needs beyond the COVID, the needs thrown up by this crisis in the course of talking to people. They'll have often found out about, you know, common needs in terms of the neighbourhood, common problems, common problems with the council, common problems with local companies or whatever. And so we want to connect with those people, find out what they've learnt, what, the, what they need, what support they need from you know, political parties or, or reunions or local government in order to continue. So I think it points to a, a new priority for the left, wherever it is, whether it's in Momentum or the Green Party or local Labour parties. Um, I think that we've got to reach out and, and make those new connections. I mean, even, even the clapping, certainly the clapping on my street, I've got to know, you know, all sorts of neighbours I didn't know. There's one down the road that has a, a big post, just a hand, a handwritten poster saying, you know, Tories out. And I, I didn't know them, you know, I'd have thought I should have known, you know, all the lefties on my street, but now I'm beginning to. Um, shall I come in as well? So, yeah, I, I basically agree with everything that Hillary said. I think, um, like you said, Sam, one of the things that is powerful about the emergence of mutual aid um, and one of the opportunities in it is to try and get people to trust their own experience of what other people are like. So like you said, I think there is actually um, empirical evidence on this from um, surveys that have been done that um, the effect of neoliberalism has been much less to make people selfish in the sense that people regard their own values as like materialistic or self-oriented and much more to make them believe that other people are selfish. Um, and there's some research by Common Cause that basically shows that. Um, and I think, you know, there's been these dual narratives going on and this competition um, for the discourse during lockdown on the one hand of all these kind of, you know, COVID idiots hashtags and pictures being shared on social media of people going out into parks and sunbathing when they shouldn't have been and um, aren't they selfish? Uh, and then there's been the kind of a lived reality of most people, which is that, you know, neighbours have just been acting really kindly to help each other out um, because that's what most people are actually like. And so, like Hillary said, and um, this goes to your question, I guess, Sam, I don't think anything is inevitable. I think, um, you know, the status quo ante could really easily reassert itself. Um, and I think it depends on what we do now. Uh, as to whether it does or not and what I would really like to see and I think Hillary sort of touched on this I feel like um, certainly after the 2019 election when there was a lot of soul searching going on about kind of where the left had gone wrong um, and what was lacking in terms of progressive infrastructure a lot of us were talking about how what we didn't have was this kind of or organic connective tissue within local communities um, that rooted us and grounded us um, in the kinds of places that progressive politics needed to advance and that was kind of organizing to meet people's immediate material needs but in a way that was also making them see those needs as political and as part of a bigger political struggle where we could act together to improve things and I think you know mutual aid at the moment is doing the first of those it's organizing to meet people's material needs but whether whether those groups become the basis for a political movement that is about democracy, economic and political democracy, and that sees the issues people are having with housing, with food, with care, whatever, as political issues, um, depends on what we do. And what I would really like to see right now, um, or, you know, over the next months and, and year, um, is some kind of project that would basically work with mutual aid groups around the country uh, that are ready and up for having a conversation together about what we're learning through the pandemic about what's wrong with society and how we'd like it to improve and how we can act together to achieve that. Um, almost like a kind of bottom, bottom up citizens convention organized through um, mutual aid groups, you know, um, that could try and kind of harness some of that collective spirit um, and some of the learning that's going on um, about the problems that exist on the ground. But kind of, I think that needs to be politicized and I don't think that's gonna happen by itself. I think that depends on it being being actively politicized yeah 
fabulous thanks both um so you kind of already strayed into a theme of question that a lot of people were already asking which is kind of yeah we, we, we love the stuff you're talking about but what's our, our route towards it and one person has mentioned something really interesting in the chat is which is this idea that since 2015 the new economy movement has really grown in strength and capacity and organization um things like the new e-commerce foundation used to be on its own but now there's a whole kind of ecosystem of organizations and movements that are have really transformed that debate and do we need a new democracy movement along similar lines is, is one of the questions that someone has posed but do you want to comment on that either of you or also add in any other details you want to give about developing that thought on how we politicize the this kind of really organic energy that's out there at the moment Sorry, I got I'm, I remuted myself, which I possibly shouldn't have done. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I think on the new economy and new democracy movement, it, as um, might be clear from what I've said already, I don't really see them as separate. Um, I think uh, they are kind of part of the same thing. I think what we need is a holistic understanding of the relationship between economic and political power. And we need to be thinking about ways in which we can build movements for the democratization of that power. Um, and I think, you know, one of the one of the reasons we see these two things as separate is because the old economics treated the economy as a sphere that was kind of separate from democratic politics when it isn't. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I, I know a lot of people also were asking questions in the chat about how change is going to happen, given that um, the left is not in power right now and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, um, of course, to get the kind of change we need, we are going to need a progressive government in power that is able to transform and reform the institutions of the state. Um, but I think in the meantime, it really depends on our ability to build sources of social power and that actually that that is critical anyway, you know, regardless of what may be done within the institutions of the state. Um, and, you know, I think Hillary mentioned unions and I think one of the really encouraging things about the crisis has been the rise of workplace organizing. Um, and as well as kind of mutual aid, which we were also already talked about. Um, a few people, I think, in the chat were also asking about local government. And I think there are opportunities, you know, in the next few years to try and um, experiment and, and encourage more imaginative approaches to local government that um, take more seriously um, ideas like participatory budgeting or citizens' assemblies, more deliberative approaches to democracy at a local level. Um, so these are the kinds of things I think, you know, given that we don't control the institutions of the state if we're serious about building a movement to democratize power i think those are the kinds of uh, activities that we need to be focusing on right now great thanks christine hillary do you want to add anything to that um yeah just um yes i i agree and i think but i spoke so trying to your question or the question in the in the um in the chat i suppose was wanting us to be to be very practical and i don't think either of us have got like an alter a clear answer but i'd say learning from you know failures and, and successes on the in the past i think maybe one should begin by by starting to help the different mutual aid groups themselves come together so you know rather than create some new structure of the left which a new democracy movement i think would would kind of automatically be we should begin from from what there is and and sort of through the mutual aid groups that we're part of in our localities sort of uh, you know find out whether other mutual aid groups want to meet up to kind of debrief after this experience and and look at what they've learned where they want to go i mean what people are saying about you know do we want to continue do mutual aid groups have a life after covid i mean I think that must be on many people's, you know, on many people's minds, and so why not start by building on that, and then, then you know, sort of that could organically lead to um, those groups then linking with the unions that have been active during the the, the crisis, 
and and you know so okay we'd be many of, of us are politically active but i think we need to slightly leave our um main political preoccupations uh and focus on 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 building this kind of movement uh not under a very um necessarily political umbrella but it would be implicitly transformative um but it would be respecting and um valuing uh what exists what has been created through this crisis so that's a rather hesitant sort of answer but i think um we've not we must just try and avoid going back to normal ourselves you know and, and actually recognize something has changed and and we must sort of work with it to some to an important extent that's really fantastic thanks and i think it's, yeah it's really important to think about oh how can we to not think rather how do we funnel this energy into our own existing movements or institutions yeah. but to work in terms of um what there is and what there could be as a result of that so um a few people have also asked uh international level questions and i thought that was really interesting because if you if we're talking about building the community level infrastructure and connectivity that i think christine in particular was talking about that kind of is part of the equation in, in winning a transformative government as as you've already said and we can see in the greek experience the reason that syriza was able to win power and um have a go at that project at least to resist the to resist the troika was based on the solidarity economy and the providing the kind of basic material needs that the state had just withdrawn from so are there any international examples of the current crisis that you've heard about that you think we should be considering and there's also been um some discussion in the chat about things like the progressive international which is a a new organization i believe to try and work on a global scale on issues like climate change that require a international response and i'm aware that the it feels to me a bit like this idea of pan state democracy is having a bit of a revival at the moment because astra taylor the filmmaker and author has written a book a year or so ago about how um that is something that we need to consider as well like does democracy need to be conceived of having an even greater level than it does at the moment so yeah any thoughts you have on that and also on the international examples that could be helping us out in how we respond to the pandemic Do you want me to go, Hilary? Sure. Okay. Uh, do you want to go first? I don't mind. No, you go first. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you asked about this because I think it's super important. Um, it's an issue that's quite close to my heart at the moment, these whole questions about internationalism. Um, so I think, you know, whether we're talking about economic or political democracy, right, the forces that we're up against um, economically, you know, you're talking about global inherently global and footloose finance capital and politically our opponent is a kind of resurgent right-wing racist nationalism and i think in neither case can you deal with those enemies if your response is limited to the nation state and focused on kind of trying to reform the nation state um, so i think we really need to be figuring out new ways to democratize global governance of the economy um, you know, uh, whether it's international financial regulation, limiting tax avoidance, um, let you say climate change. Someone in the chat, I think, mentioned the Progressive International, which is this new kind of Yanis Varoufakis um, outfit, which is quite interesting, I think, as an attempt to sort of build bridges between progressives internationally. Um, in terms of your question about examples that we can learn from from other countries, um, it's an interesting one. I'll, um, maybe try and look into a bit more, but one that springs to mind is, I think it was Portugal, um, quite near the outset of the crisis, gave essentially temporary citizenship rights to all migrants, um, reflecting this understanding that in a public health crisis, you know, society is only as strong as its weakest link, everybody needs access to the basic protections of the, um, of the state and of social security. Um, and I think, like I said, given that our, our opponent is a kind of small minded racist nationalism, essentially, um, those kinds of examples are really important in thinking about what kind of vision of democratic citizenship we are trying to build. Um, you know, that it's not a, a kind of 
concept of citizenship that is based on where you were born that is based on your belonging to a community um so i don't know if that really answers your question but that is one example that springs to mind that i, I really wish that the uk would <laughs> learn something from yes um i agree with that and um i'd add just from the chat to some paul cottrell mentions kerala and i mean i just during this lockdown i've just noticed that you know all the discussions all these zooms are incredibly international you know people are participating on a global level um so in a way this this idea of an international it doesn't need to be created it's it's emerging and i think i'd like to see it emerging you know being encouraged much more from below than being corralled you know i mean i i respect what yanis varoufakis has done in many ways but i think that the experience of Greece indicates that not enough was done to actually nurture the solidarity economy and that um, actually Syriza um, moved too far away from that um, bottom-up politics and economics uh, in its um, focus on government. So I think we've got to take um, building up links internationally much more seriously direct links so you know actually making connections with Kerala where you know there's a long tradition of cooperative development of a sort of um, form of political economy which links democratic local government with the development of a cooperative economy so um, more learning from those experiences including their their sort of limits I think is important and you know I think that 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 can make use of the the new technology, which obviously has got many limits, but I think it does enable us to make these 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 global connections. But also, we've got to recognise the, the the digital the digital divide and how many of the 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 groupings that will be developing new forms of mutuality, you know, like in South Africa, for example, um, you know, will will not necessarily be um, easily connected um, through the through digital mechanisms and networks so we've got to have a sort of humility about that fabulous thanks both so just one final question that's kind of crushing together a few things that have been in the chat um, lots of people are very concerned about kind of austerity 2.0 after this and I think it's just something worth raising because it's yeah because of the level of concern about it so is the answer to that in the mobilizing and politicizing the emerging mutuality that we've already talked about or is there a specific approach that you think we need to buttress that essentially and another thing i wanted to throw in there if it's okay is um the treatment and experience of women in the pandemic because the the economic conditions are disproportionately affecting women women are disproportionately taking up the slack in terms of childcare. And, and in other ways, so is there anything you'd want to add to that part of the discussion? Do you want to go, Hilary, or do you want me to go? Um, well, we've got into a pattern, you go first. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, I'll take childcare first, because um, it's something that's quite close to my heart, given that I've been locked down with a one-year-old for about two months. Nobody needs to tell me <laughs> about the pressures of lockdown childcare. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, if I can, I'll put a link in the chat. I've, I've written about this for The Guardian recently, so I can um, not wang on for too long. You can read if you're interested <laughs> in my thoughts on that. But I think, um, you know, when I was talking in my opening remarks about some of the things that are just invisible to the Westminster elite that are making policy, I think that childcare is absolutely one of those things. And another really amazing moment um, in that liaison committee hearing was when Boris Johnson was asked about childcare and what he was doing to support the childcare sector. And he basically gave an answer that I think he could have given if he had literally never heard the word childcare before and didn't know what it was. He basically said nothing. Um, government guidance that came out on the easing of lockdown, it became apparent quite quickly that they literally didn't know what a childminder was. And then they had to kind of hastily reverse engineer new rules about how many children childminders could have into their home. 
um, with the with the lockdown easing because they hadn't understood that childminders actually had people into their homes and didn't go out to parents' homes to provide childcare. Um, so I think the the invisibility of care and the way that care is disproportionately being taken on by women in the home um, has become really excruciatingly apparent in this crisis. But the sort of difficulty and the irony with that really is that it's only it's only excruciatingly apparent at the moment to the people it's affecting and it's still quite invisible to a lot of other people. So I think um, one of the things that I'm actually talking to, to some other people and activists about at the moment is how we do kind of capitalise on this moment to politicise that issue of care and make common cause between paid and unpaid carers. Um, then on the austerity thing, just quickly, I think um, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is, is how to make sure that we're not kind of fighting the last war. Um, because although I think, of course, we will see the Tories trying to use the massive amounts of borrowing that have um, had to be done because of the pandemic as an excuse or a justification for not investing in things they don't want to invest in or for cutting things they want to cut. I don't think that we're going to just see a straightforward rerun of 2010 austerity because I think they're, they're not that stupid. You know, they're not going to freeze nurses' wages after everyone's been out on their front doorsteps clapping for carers every week through the, you know, I don't, I, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I don't think they are that stupid. So I think the narrative that we're going to see coming out of the crisis about why we can't afford to spend on this, that or the other is going to be different from last time. And we need to figure out how to respond differently um, and that doesn't really answer your question, but it's just, yeah, it's a note of caution because I'm seeing a lot of people kind of rerunning arguments, I think, that, um, that we had in 2010. And I think we need, to, we need to try and game that out a bit and figure out what, what we can realistically expect them to do and then we can figure out how to respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with um, Christine. Um, I think that, the, that on, the, on the question of women, I, I think that um, in a way you can see women are like at, absolutely at the kind of cusp of this tension between or this conflict between an, getting back to an economy driven by profit and um, the the needs of 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 human beings of people as 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 mothers as 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 people uh, you know because on the one hand the economy depends on on women working you know working um for, for low pay working in in low pay jobs but nevertheless you know th that that's a key part of the economy um and on the other hand society depends on on women looking after children which is a, a hidden part of the economy and so so women are absolutely pivotal and you know more and more is becoming clear about their role in in child care in the the reproduction of the labour force because you know they've been homeschooling, they've been they've been you know basically responsible for for the education of kids. Um, I mean necessarily because because that's been the only safe solution. But it's not been it's not been it's not led to any recognition of of, of domestic work as as a crucial part of the economy and therefore um, work that needs to be supported whether by better childcare, better nursery provision um, or by um, a change in the working week and in paternity and parental uh, leave so that that, that work can be properly uh, shared. So I think in a way we need almost like um, amongst all these networks of mutuality there needs to be a, a network of, of, of women. Uh, also linking very much up, I agree with Christine, with um, women in the workplace who again are exploited because of the traditional assumption of their caring role. I mean, just the scandal of what's happened in care homes, I think is, is very related to, and, and in elderly care, is related to um, the assumptions about, about women that, that they, can be, they can be assumed to be caring and hardly need to be properly paid for what they're doing. It's not recognized as skilled, incredibly skilled, work um on the austerity issue i mean i i think we've got to watch this because i sort of you can see a little bit in the shifts that sunak has been through that on the one hand at one point he's been incredibly generous you know we'll do everything it takes you know to to provide 
uh, for people in the face of this crisis to now, you know, looking for compromises, beginning to, to pull back. So we're not going to see a repeat of the, um, the, the old austerity program, but we are going to see a, an attempt to return to, to normal. Um, and that's going to involve um, not fulfilling the commitment to pay. Well, I don't know if they've, I don't think they've made any commitment to, to pay um, nurses properly, but I, I, don't, I think it's going to be difficult for them to, to, to cut um, public sector wages, but I think there won't be the kind of rewards that are needed. So I think that, um, you know, the, the, the public service unions will need to be going, you know, onto the offensive in the way the teachers have done uh, to, to make the most of this huge awareness of the role that, that the caring um, caring workers are, are playing um, in looking after us. Fabulous. Thanks so much both. I've really, really enjoyed that Q&A. So we want to give everyone 10 minutes now to have a discussion about some of the ideas that have been raised and maybe how we can start to take action on those. So we're going to have a 10 minute session of breakout rooms where you're in groups of about five, six people to talk about what we've heard today. So please organise amongst yourselves to appoint a facilitator who will try and make sure that everyone gets their say and can then offer to feed back some of the discussion to the main group before we wrap up uh, this evening. And again, just to reiterate, please treat people as you would in real life, if not more nicely. So the questions to discuss in your group are, what were you most struck by during the talks? Um, something you didn't expect, for example. And what can we do during lockdown to popularise some of the ideas outlined today, like politicising mutual aid and just reimagining the state as something that has participation from the bottom up? So without um, waiting any longer, I will put you into your groups now. Billy and Christine, take a um, feel free to take a camera break or do whatever if you like. Thanks. If anyone's just joined or has come back into the call, we're just in our breakout room session at the moment. So it's fine to just hang out here whilst that's going on. But if you want to be put into a group for the discussion, just let me know and we'll sort that out.
Hi everyone, we're about three minutes away now from bringing everyone back together for the final discussion. just about a minute and a half now until everyone comes back into the main room. it cool to down a bit Christine where you are the sun is still so hot on me I've had to close the curtains to avoid the glare uh, yeah no I'm in the shade as you can probably tell yeah cool just got 30 seconds to go now Okay, everyone's filtering back in now. All right, welcome back everyone. So if you were happy to summarize on behalf of your group to just give us a one minute top summary of the discussion you had, you can use the raise hand function on the right using, um, sorry, on the participants list using the raise hand function. So does anyone want to, okay, we've got Eddie. I'm gonna unmute you to feedback for us. Hello, Eddie. Hi, yeah, we just had a few points from our discussion. Um, the first one was, it's a little bit worrying that the sort of Dominic Cummings fiasco, the, the, the sort of um, reaction from the government has shown they still don't really want to listen. Um, and the longer that goes on, it looks as if they're looking for ways to distract us from that issue and they seem, in, in some ways they seem to continue um, with a sort of distraction thing as well, you know, like um, if we get hot in one topic, they'll maybe try and take us on to another. Um, another point from our discussion was the local democracy groups could get more and more important, more and more um, needed. So trying to you know, look for um, solid committees, citizens' assembly. Anywhere we we can pen, we can raise awareness um, in our own communities. And if everyone was doing that, could have a everyone was doing that, it could have a big impact on a national scale. Um, and the last point, just quickly, was. Um, uh, Schools, there's who are quite worried with what they're doing with 
the schools um, coming up, and I think that could be one thing we could um, try and um, somehow uh, protest against during lockdown, because that seems to be one of the the, 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 the things that are is coming up soon that we that might have a lot of parents worried and a lot of people thinking, well, this is not very maybe not a lot of parents have got a say in it and it could be a risky situation. Great Eddie, thanks so much for that. Um I'm gonna bring Andy in next to to feedback as well. Hello Andy. Hello from Northumberland. We we were struck by the thing that I've talked about the most is how intertwined political and economic uh, spheres are and however much change you get in the political one if you can't change the power that big businesses have and their sort of transnational nature that's not going to really make much of a difference. Uh, the, the need for some unity of uh, body of expressing opinions like we're doing and actually getting the unity together my sort of counter argument is it's not so much unity but it's actually getting far more people involved there's a danger i'm not really of the left or an activist but i'm interested in it and i think there's lots of people who when they see people who are too sort of activists they sort of shy away i don't know whether they just leave it to other people to do it or they think they shouldn't be involved in it uh, Citizens Assembly, it was definite interest in that, but a degree of cynicism as to whether it will actually be listened to or the writing up of it, or it'll sort of get filed in a drawer somewhere in Whitehall, particularly the sort of climate change one, and it's a bit of a sop to the um, Extinction Rebellion. Um, the local government point, that, and that sort of took me into, I'll use my prerogative as summing up for the group. One of my ideas I've banged on for years is for sort of a county council type level, you need three types of councillor, one third elected, first past the post for an individual ward. Lots of people don't care about their politics, you just want them to be local and understand what's going on. Another third proportional across the whole area, so minority groups like Greens or even, God forbid, BNP, or if they get over a threshold, their voice is heard so they can't say they're excluded. And then the slightly wacky third, which ties in a little bit with the citizens' assemblies, is you have a third of the councillors selected at random from the electoral roll, like jurors, so that you get some normal people in the council chamber, and their votes have to count for the council to make a decision. So you can't, so that it sharpens up your argument. You don't. It, it's like the argument of scientists. If you are good and confident about your argument, you will be able to explain it to ordinary people. And it doesn't mean if you, with only the political class being involved in politics, they speak their own lingua and are out of touch with other people. That was the points that I've taken back from it. I don't know whether anybody else, uh, Chris or Marcus, want to shoot me down. I've missed out anything. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Fabulous. Okay, we're going to have to bring it to a close, I'm afraid, because we've had such great time with the, the questions. So, um, Hilary and Christina, is there anything you'd want to say just to sum up in? response to those groups or just anything else to, to close us off with really i'll unmute you both no hillary needs unmuting too there we are gosh i'm going to jump in and go first just because i don't think i have anything very profound to say so then the burden of having the last word is going to be on hillary instead <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was really interested in um, what one of the groups was talking about, about schools reopening, actually. I kind of, I, I agree and I think, you know, um, it might be that there are, there are things like that through the crisis that are actually, there's a lot of things happening at the moment that people are experiencing in a kind of very existential way, like that are very immediate and real to our lives in a way that politics doesn't always feel. Um, and I think a lot of people who maybe might not be that interested in abstract arguments about democracy, there is a window of opportunity now if we stand alongside them um, and, you know, support their demands to have a voice in the decisions that they care about right now, like where the school should reopen when it's patently not safe. Um, then I think there is a real opportunity to, you know, some people have been saying in the chat to kind of reach out beyond our bubbles and to, to try and kind of build a broader base and a broader movement for a more democratic society and economy. That's me done, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you very much for having me. 
Um, well, I, I can, I, I mean, I, like Christine, I don't have anything particularly profound, but I do think we should end on the note of, of feeling that we can do something that, um, you know, it's not a matter of sort of fate or, or I, I, either of sort of just waiting for things to happen or thinking that, you know, there's an alternative in somebody's pocket, you know, we've got to kind of make that alternative and make it with the resources that exist. So um, I hope that, you know, we'll meet each other again in the context of some coming together of all these um, forms of mutual aid, including, um, you know, people that are working together around an issue like um, not going back to school until the schools are patently safe. So I'd say that there needs to be a more curious and almost investigative part to our politics of actually finding out what's going on in our local areas and then and then talking to people in those in in our local groups um now that, that we can have people in our gardens if we've got gardens or meet in the park so you know i don't know i'm just thinking what what i could do you know i i think i would sort of maybe go back to all the little notices i've seen on on um in laundrettes and in on the, the fences of parks and playgrounds and take their numbers and say um text them say should we just meet in the park and and see how it's been you know what we've learned from this last three months and then you know see what happens maybe connect with if christine's doing the same in manchester then we could you know plan a visit from hackney to manchester or or vice versa anyway i mean obviously it's everything's difficult under lockdown but but we've learned about zoom you know maybe we can do something creative in each other's gardens or in the parks um so i think each of us should just think creatively about how we can reach out to people we know who are sort of you know being activated by this experience and who who want to connect with their neighbors and maybe beyond their neighborhoods and i think as as vicky and our group was saying we've got to we got to reach out we've got to go beyond um the left which you know i think it's difficult now because there's been this period of sort of trying to recover from the the december defeat so that's led to quite an inward looking kind of culture and somehow we've got to use the fact that we've been shaken by this crisis and we've had to change so let's keep that feeling of change and openness in our minds as we kind of go back to normal but don't go back to normal refuse to go back to normal create an, an abnormal alternative Brilliant. wow thank you so much both and for everyone who's taken part tonight I've, I've found it a really really exhilarating and exciting conversation to have like what's really come out of it for me is kind of the need to go back to the local and explore the local in different ways but also yeah experiment and, and reach out so thanks so much for that so um, this is the final session of the week and I think it's really been one, one of the best so thank you for everyone for taking part. So what well, after this, so the route out of lockdown isn't very clear and it's not going to go back to normal like we've already been saying but what this has to be about is having a conversation about the values that we want at the heart of a new political system who want it to be better than the one that we've had before. So there's a couple of things that Unlock Democracy is doing in the, ne in the following weeks it, as in the spirit of that. This is something that needs to be done by lots of different networks, not lots of different organisations, but we're going to be hosting a study group, we're calling it, where we think about the foundations of our democracy and the kind of contradictions that are involved in, in that. So it's going much deeper than should we have PR, for example, and going into a lot deeper discussions like the ones we've had tonight. So if you feel like you might want to be involved in that, it's a a Zoom type call as well. Make sure that you're on our email list and you can hear about that. If you're not on our email list, Matthew's posted in the chat how you can do that. Secondly, we're also working on a, a campaign that we're loosely at the moment calling a democratic recovery, which is a semi crowdsourced idea for collecting principles by which we think democracy needs to be run after the pandemic. So there's clear things about accountability and scrutiny, but that's really something we're interested in exploring with other people in terms of helping shape that. And I think as people that have